Hello and welcome to video number three in my Ontario Arts Council non to bracket low toxicity stone lithography research. I'm so excited that you're here. My name is Kyle and we are on this magical voyage of learning how to do stone lithography in the least toxic way possible. We haven't done any stone lithography in almost 15 years, but we are trying it. We are replacing nitric acid with tannic acid, we're moving away from solvents, and we're trying our best to make some stone lithography prints relatively safely. We are following along with Dwight Pogue's Printmaking Revolution, and we are referencing some other printmaking books. This is the third video in the series. If you haven't watched the second video or the first video, you might want to go back and watch those. In our second video, we prepared the stones to get them ready to be etched. We grained them down, we removed the previous image, and we applied marks, and we made our test stones. And in today's video, what we are doing is we're going to be etching those. We're going to get those stones from the mark making stage through the etching stage, and we're going to pull our first proofs and hopefully one, maybe two good copies. And we're actually going to talk about what we get versus what we drew. And I'm really excited to see what happens. I'm praying that things work. Join me today on Artist Confessional as we etch some stones. What are the secrets of studio practice? If you are new to this video series in our channel, please consider hitting that subscribe button, hitting that like button, those things really help us to grow and that's really important for me to keep making videos like this one. A shout out and a big thank you to the Ontario Arts Council for supporting me in this research project. Starting the etching process off, we are going to rosin the stone and then we're going to talc the stone. These two steps ensure that the drawing base is really primed and ready for the etching to be applied on top of it. We're going to begin the etching process by rosining the stone. This is a light yellow to amber colored powder that gets brushed across the whole surface. Excess is then brushed away and what this does is it protects the greasy marks from the power of the acid. Now with rosin, it's a powder. It's incredibly fine and it doesn't decompose in your lungs. So it's incredibly important that I wear a respirator. After rosining the stone, we talc it. What we are doing is we're going to apply it onto the stone with like a really soft brush and we're going to brush all the excess away and this is going to help kind of tighten up the grease spots, remove any moisture on the stone and when we start applying the gum it's going to make sure that like it doesn't smear as much when we start to buff down our etch end with cheesecloth. We're also going to continue wearing that respirator while we work with the talcum powder. If you don't have access to the ventilation hood and you have limited to no access to the outdoors, what I can recommend is wear a respirator, do all of the work, and then when you're finished, leave. This will give the powder in the air a bit of time to settle. Opening a window will help kind of clear out the air in the space. It'll take a lot longer for that air to exchange versus using like a fan or in the case of a ventilation system or the outdoors. You want to give it a bit of time. After rosin and talking the stone, the stone is actually ready to be either stored or it can be etched. If you are going to store it, you want to wrap it in some sort of non-oily paper. I would recommend like an archival paper placed on top, maybe some newsprint wrapped around that and taped to the edges of the stone. This will help keep dust, sediment, extra grease, all of these kinds of things from penetrating into the stone while it sits on a shelf for however long until you get back to the work on it. Kind of up until this point, everything's been kind of just the same. Drawing is the same, things like that, just a bit of a consideration for the types of materials and what personal protective gear you're wearing. Here things change. We have old stone lithography and we're leaving that behind and we're going to follow along in Dwight Pogue's book and we're going to explore tannic acid and how to etch with it. Printmaking Revolution really clearly outlines that you can etch the number four and the number five crayon marks with just straight gum, while the number two and the number three kind of marks you use a mixture of tannic acid and gum arabic and the darkest of the marks, the number ones, or the really thick parts, you can use straight tannic acid. I did find that there was a bit of a difference between what was written in his book and the visual guides that give you the step-by-step -step directions. In the step-by-step -step directions in Dwight's book, they seem to just etch with gum arabic and tannic acid. The whole image. It doesn't matter if there was marks that were very light or very dark. So the other books did outline how to use nitric acid and then the oldest book had actually a tannic acid etching table. I find this interesting because at some point it did seem that this was a plausible solution and I'm not entirely sure why tannic acid falls out of favor in, for nitric acid in the mid-century, 
but it seems to happen across the board. Many of the books actually just forget about the other acids and only talk about nitric acid. But I also found it really interesting that all of the books also all mention that you can etch the lightest marks with just straight gum arabic. I don't know how long a, like an image etched with only gum arabic would print for, but I feel like you could probably pull a couple prints before it like totally scummed in or something along those lines. But I'd be curious in a future video to see what happens if you just make a stone with only gum arabic and you have no acid and we just get rid of that completely. Chrissy and I are going to start the whole etching process by getting gum arabic, water, some soft brushes, little tiny shot glasses, and our tannic acid. In printmaking histories and processes, that book outlines that you can use graphite as a drawing material, but if you are going to use graphite as a drawing material, you have to etch it with half gum and half water, which is exactly what we did. We mixed up a small shot glass solutions worth, and we used a really soft brush and applied it onto the stone, and we puddled it. We let that puddle sit. We did not let it dry. We do not want to let it dry. We want to keep that solution moving so it has an opportunity for the gum arabic to penetrate into the open pores of the stone. The number five crayon and the number four crayon, these are the harder crayons. They make the lightest of the marks. These get etched with just straight gum arabic. While we were etching this space for about a minute or a minute and a half, we used our previous brush to keep the half gum and half water section moving ever so often so that it didn't harden into a big thick mess. The number two and number three crayons, we used a mixture of gum arabic and tannic acid. 50-50, we poured it into a shot glass and we used a brush to move it around while continuing to move the other two etchants around as well. The darkest of the marks, we used a straight tannic acid onto those spaces. After applying the tannic acid, we set a two minute timer. We kept all the individual puddles moving and so that the etchant didn't have a chance to dry. I want to avoid taking that like straight tannic and brushing that straight tannic into the lighter areas of the stone. This is because that tannic acid might be powerful enough to actually start to break down the greasy marks of the lightest of the crayons. If you don't, you might find that you're losing marks in the printing process. After that two minute timer, we buff down the image. And what this is doing is it's removing all the excess material like the gum arabic and the tannic acid. And we're reducing that film from a kind of the sopping wet mess down to a very tight, thin, dry film. As you kind of work it, it starts to feel sticky and as you start to buff it and you move into like a clean piece of cheesecloth and you begin to really buff the stone, it should feel like it has a bit of resistance as you buff across it, but it'll start to actually feel quite smooth. When it comes to how to buff something that has multiple different etchant values, what you want to avoid is taking the dark tannic acid and pulling that into the lightest spots. So when you're buffing and you're buffing those little tight circles, begin by buffing in the lightest of area and buff a bit there, then move to the middle tones, buff those, and then move to the dark tones, buffing those, then change cheesecloth and start at the light tones, and then go to the medium, then to the dark, new cheesecloth, light, medium, dark, repeat that process. And that's how you tackle buffing a stone with multiple strengths of etchant on it. Now that we've rosined and we have talcumed the stone, we've etched it with varying degrees of like gum arabic, water, and tannic acid, we leave it for one night. The next two solutions that we apply onto the stone is called Biosolute and then Biolac. These are a weirdly sweet smelling chemical. I'm gonna do all of this work outside because I don't want my studio to smell weirdly artificially sweet. We can use a vapor respirator to help reduce some of that inhalation exposure. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna wear big fat neoprene gloves, not vinyl, like just big chemical resistant gloves. And obviously I'm gonna wear goggles. I do not want any of this hitting my eyeballs because let's, no. The gum arabic and etchant is sitting in all the negative spots of the stone while we have kind of all of this greasy material everywhere else, our positive marks. We are gonna do what's called a washout next. In the Printmaking Revolution book, it suggests to use Biosolute as a washout as opposed to lithotine. We are going to apply this to the stone and it's going to hopefully remove those greasy marks from the stone. It's going to hopefully not affect any of the water-based gum arabic. Now we're going to apply a small puddle. We are going to work that little puddle with a piece of paper towel and we are going to gently rub this across the entire surface of the stone and we're going to give it time. We want this solution to interact with the greasy parts to break them down and release some of it. The Printmaking Revolution book does say that you need about half as much biosolute to be as effective as lithotine, but you have to work at it for twice as long. Now, I honestly cannot remember how much actually gets removed in this stage. Back in university, I really feel like sometimes the image would completely disappear and our stone 
it doesn't. It kind of looks like this. It looks a little bit like it's kind of there. It's definitely become like chalkier in tone and it's reduced its like, kind of intensity, but it hasn't disappeared. So the BioSolute is the replacement for lithotene. This is the solvent that removes the greasy material but leaves the gum arabic because it's a solvent based and not water based. Gum arabic dissolves in water, not in the solvent. And what you want to do is remove all the drawing material. I tried with a rag first. I think the rag absorbs too much and I'd rather use like a paper towel or a cloth. I feel like this is kind of where there's a bit of like, uh, what did the book say moment? The book has some good instructions, but it definitely feels like it's missing some details in between these steps and kind of that specific, like how long did you brush it on? How much pressure did you apply? How did you do this? Where did you like do it? How much? When you say a small puddle and that requires less than lithotene and I poured a little bit on, I actually don't know how much lithotene you'd use in the first place because I have never used it. <laughs> So I tried my best and uh, it, might, it might work, it might fail, it, things might happen, it's okay. I tried to just use a very small, like maybe this size, um, like a Canadian toonie size amount of the BioSolute on the stone and then just rubbed it around with paper towel for a duration. I don't think we timed it, so I don't know how long, until some of the image started to disappear. When I put the BioSolute onto the stone, it felt a little like um, baby oil in consistency and it moved around really nicely. I noticed very quickly that the litho crayons pulled up in a way that felt familiar. Still not exactly the same, but familiar. And the touche washes also uh, lifted really nicely. You'll see in the images that I had done like a large square of touche in the lower part of my second column, and it washed out more the way I would expect things to wash out. But once it started to dry a little bit, I didn't want to put more on because the book does say you only need a small amount. So once it started to dry, I assumed that meant you're done and I stopped doing it. We'll see if that was a good or a bad decision. After the bio salute, I put on the bio lac like a very small puddle. I don't know what um, currency size it was, but it was little. I rubbed that around with cheesecloth for 50 seconds. I counted it in my head and then I buffed it with cheesecloth and then blow dried it for the five minutes. Exactly like the printmaking revolution book said to do. It didn't deviate a bit. What this is doing is it's adhering to all those greasy areas or formerly greasy areas, any spot that is now exposed on the stone that doesn't have gum arabic on it. And it is gonna create an even printmaking base for our ink to sit on top of. If I'm being perfectly honest, the Biolac step, which I think substituted our Estesol with a little bit of ink in it step when we were at school, I have no memory of that. So I don't have any expectations. Something I will say is that it is smelly. It's smelly in a way that even if we had a good ventilation system, which I don't really know what that's like, so I guess I don't have a, like a baseline of what that would do, but I would prefer to not have it in the studio. I like our studio sometimes smelling like ink, but mostly being scent free. So. I'm perfectly happy to just do that outside. I would do it in the winter. Honestly, it doesn't get so cold that I couldn't figure out how to make that work. Full disclosure, we are well beyond that, like the next day framework. It has been multiple days since I washed out this image and rubbed BioLac into it. This could bite me in the ass. I'm hoping it doesn't, and I'm hoping it's really forgiving. I don't remember stone lithography to be very forgiving, but we're gonna see what happens. Stuff gets in the way, life, everything else, and Chrissy and I meant to come back and continue this project, but instead I edited all of episode two. We are in the studio. We are going to ink up one of these stones and get it through its second etch. We're gonna use a leather roller. This roller is dedicated to just inking up stones. It needs to be leather, not a composite roller. The nape of the leather is really important in terms of applying that ink in a very consistent and even pattern. I had wrapped this leather roller in a piece of acetate, and then I had shrink wrapped the whole thing and then wrapped that in newsprint to protect it from the sun. I'm really hoping it hasn't dried out yet. I did this like four or five years ago anticipating that like I would come back and actually use this roller. All the fibers have been compressed down from being kind of just essentially shrink wrapped for a while. It seems somewhat okay. I don't know if it's actually okay. What we're gonna do is try to just kind of scrape it and see if there's any of that nape still left. One way is going to like draw the nape up and one way is going to lay the nape down. And I'm just trying to loosen up those fibers of the leather so that they can be a little bit more free when we go to ink it up. While Kyle's doing that, I'll take you all on a cute puppy break. My cute puppy. You don't want to be on camera? No?
I feel like it hasn't totally dried, and if I apply some new ink onto this and give it a little bit of working, it should come to life a little bit. However, if everything goes terrible, I'll scrape it all clean, I'll rub it down with some tallow, and it will sit for maybe like a week, and then I'll come back to it. And hopefully that towel kind of works to rehydrate and re, I guess, invigorate that leather roller. If you have a really light image and a light drawing, you're gonna use 100% shot black. If you have a drawing that's primarily medium tones, you're gonna use 70% shot black, 30% crayon black. If you have a drawing that's really heavy and well, you've made really good use of those number one and two crayons, you're going to primarily only ink up with crayon black. For our stones, we are going to use a 70-30 mixture that kind of middle tone, that middle range, and we're gonna see how we do. Our crayon black is incredibly stiff. And so when it talks about how using crayon black for the darkest images, you want the stiffest ink possible. So if you could imagine taking a crayon and really scrubbing away at a section and trying to make a really black part, there might still be little white dots. And the stiffer the ink, the more of those white dots you're gonna preserve, whereas a looser ink would fill in those white dots. And so that's why the crayon's black feels just almost like a rock. It is hard, like I'm bending the metal to get this out of the can. Like I can see that there's actually a crevice all yeah, the way down to the bottom of the can, which kind of makes me think that like this ink started off incredibly viscous because it was so thick to begin with that when it settled into the can, it didn't self-level out to being flat and pressed up against the walls. Hey, all you lithographers, is crayon black supposed to be like this? It feels like I'm bending a spoon in a tub of ice cream trying to get this stuff out. Is that normal? Our shot mix, on the other hand, is what's suggested when you have a lighter drawing. And I'm hoping that this is less stiff. So this is a lot more buttery. So I've put out a whole bunch of ink onto the glass slab and it is unreal how stiff this is. These are Hanko inks. I've never had the pleasure of using these, but I know that they are like a really fantastic printmaking ink. This was questionable. The leather roller maybe has been in storage for really long and I'm praying that four or five prints down the road, it might loosen up a little bit. What's gonna happen next is we are going to wash out our stone using cold water and a piece of paper towel. This is gonna remove a lot of that gum arabic and all the grease and things on top. And then we are going to sponge it down to a thin water film and ink up the stone. While it's in this state, the water on the stone will repel the oil-based ink and the oil-based ink will sit wherever we have placed the biowack. We are going to sponge it down to a thin film, make sure it's nice and thin, and we are going to try to roll it up. Sponge again. It's slowly beginning to ink up. By slowly, I mean real slow. That's okay. I would rather ink up a block really slowly than to apply too much ink and try to pull ink off of a stone. So for right now, I'm gonna keep going at this. I'm gonna keep sponging, reducing it to a thin film, and then applying ink with the roller. You can start to see that some of the lines are actually now starting to become quite emboldened, such as the grid lines that separate each one of the test strips are starting to fill in a little bit more black and a little bit more robust. We inked it up, it worked. Well, we won't actually know if it worked or not until we print the stone, but we actually inked it up. It looks black. It looks like ink went where it was supposed to. This is a success. We put ink onto a stone in very specific locations. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about this. You know, like I didn't, I didn't have much faith in my leather roller, but it pulled through. Okay, so we've done our first etch and this is looking really good. Now we're getting ready to move into our second etch. What I wanna do is I wanna pull two proofs and inspect that second proof to make sure that what's here on the stone is good and then I can commit to it and put the second etch in and then we can pull another proof and then an actual good one after that. So I'm gonna dampen the stone ever so slightly, we're gonna send it through the press and then maybe we'll have ink actually transfer onto a piece of paper. I imagine we're gonna have to fiddle with the pressure of the press. There's an image! Things happened! Things happened! Look! Ready? Mm -hmm. Is that darker? Yes. Quite a lot darker. Still not dark enough in my opinion, but... We pulled a couple... Okay, I wouldn't say they're good prints. They're a little bit on the weak side, but... 
We pulled a few proofs. We pulled the two onto BFK Reefs paper to see how they look. I think that we probably have an issue with our pressure on the press, but we're gonna move on from here. I'm gonna re-dampen the stone and I'm gonna re-ink the stone and we're going to apply tannic acid to the stone as our second etch. So normally we would do a second etch, we'd leave it overnight and it'd be pretty much identical to our first etch. With the Printmaking Revolution book, Dwight outlines the steps to do what's called a quick etch. He says that this is pretty good for about 20 to 40 prints. I think that that's going to be enough for me. I don't expect to do additions of 100 or 1000, so we're just going to do a quick etch with this stone and move on. We apply the etch, we let it sit for about 5 minutes, and then we sponge it off and we come right back into rolling up. This stone has been sitting for a full 10 minutes. We're gonna wash this out. We're going to pull out a new roller. We are going to use the Vansom Black and we are going to ink up this stone. So what I'm looking for, which I doubt that the camera can pick up, is that we are building up a very, very subtle stipple. I'm trying to zoom in on it. Ooh, camera angles. Oh. What I want to do is I just want to work it all with the sponge and I want to be a bit gentle but I want to put enough force behind it to remove some of that uh, the streaking that happened when we inked up. The whoopsies? That's a very good way of putting it. One single pass. Here we go. Here we are after our second etch with a single pass of rubber-based Vance and ink, and this is what it's looking like. Super, super satisfying. I would say that's a success. Let's hope it works for all the other good papers and stuff like that. Sometimes, sometimes the newsprint looks better than the actual finished print. And this is a problem in printmaking because it's, not it's just garbage paper. It's like not archival, it will yellow, it will deteriorate in 10 years, but sometimes it makes for the best prints. I'm gonna keep inking this up. I'm gonna pull another two proofs. The first proof is always light, while the subsequent proofs just kind of get a little bit darker. Around your third or fourth, it should stabilize into what you feel is like gonna be the end image. I kind of wish already that my print stayed lighter. I feel like it had a lot more depth and range. My second proof has a lot of dark tones, very few light to medium tones. Kyle did the quick etch that is outlined in the Print Revolution book. With Kyle Stone, we noticed that it got a little smudgy. It seems like the quick etch doesn't have this talc rosin step. We also might have had a little bit too much ink on the stone, so it smudged the greasy bits around. I'm going to do the traditional etch that is outlined in the Print Revolution book. I'm not going to pull a proof of this, I'm just going to roll it up, and if it looks nice, I'm going to rosin, talc, and etch it. We're going to wait a full 24 hours. Fingers crossed we only wait 24 hours and come back and print the stone the next day. So I have my stone inked and I'm seeing some good things. All of the crayon is looking the way I would imagine the crayon to look. The touche wash that was done with the alcohol also looks pretty good. The water and the touche, not so much, not so good. I can see it actually now that the stone's dry, but I don't think it's gonna print at all. The giant block of touche that I had done and I put like a gum kind of drawing on top of it, nothing. It just looks like a, a black square, which is okay, that's fine. The uh, upper portion where I use the autographic ink, it looks good. The India ink, it, you can see it, but it also didn't wash out with the BioSolute, so it doesn't look like it's holding any ink from what I can see. So I think it's just on the stone now. Graphite super light doesn't seem to be doing anything, so I don't think we're gonna see anything from that. China marker is holding some ink, but it looks really faint. And then all the like um, scrubby stick, smudge stick, all the smudging looks good. I thought it was a mistake at first. I thought I had like, whoopsie smudged it a little bit when I was rubbing it out, but then I remembered I did that on purpose, so. Now I'm gonna take the stone, I'm gonna put some rosin and talc on it and prepare it for the second etch. Yesterday, we etched my stone for its second etch. 
Today, it's literally just been a day, we're really nailing it this time, we are going to pull prints off of this stone. Well, I mean, fingers crossed, that's the plan. So what I need to do first is take that Vanson black ink that Kyle used for his print, and we are going to mix some magnesium carbonate into it to stiffen it up in the hopes that it will be less smudgy. I'm looking for the ink to get a bit of a duller look to it and for it to have a really short break off point when I put the palette knife against it and pull up directly. Getting ready for my first roll up, my first proof. Sponge down my stone so there's a nice thin layer of water. It's a very necessary step with litho. You don't wanna forget to do the sponging step or you'll get ink everywhere. I'm gonna do a few passes with the ink I'm gonna roll up a few passes, but I'm not gonna re-ink the roller. I wanna keep the stone pretty lightly inked for this first proof. And I'm gonna pull it on newsprint because I don't wanna waste any good paper. Always gets very exciting when you, you know, are just about to pull that piece of paper off and see what is actually being transferred. And you know what? Overall, pretty good. It's light, but it's also the first pass, so it's only gonna get more built up from here. Chrissy's pulled off a test proof. I'm so excited about this because now we can actually take a look at what her stone looked like before and what the final result was. Now, I think Chrissy had a lot more success than me and so I asked if she would be kind enough to ink up my stone again and run it through the press. I had spent a bunch of time trying to reduce the ink quantity on the stone, which was a tough go, but I think I did okay. So here is what my stone ends up looking like while inked and here's what the final print looks like. We did it! We made prints off of stones, oh my god. Right? I can't believe this actually happened. Both Chrissy and I had big success. That's it for our journey today. Thank you so much for being with me. I'm really excited. We got to make some prints off of stones, which is so freaking rad. I cannot believe that that worked. I'm really excited for what comes next. I have way too many questions. My mind is buzzing. I have a bajillion things I want to talk about. Join me next time on our Ontario Arts Council non to low toxicity stone lithography research as Chrissy and I actually try to make a small edition. We're going to go for five prints in the edition. I'm really excited and I can't wait to try to make some actual art off of stones. What are the secrets of studio?